Let us open uh, God's Word together to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12 for our continuing um, consideration of this wonderful book uh, of Romans. I think we're approaching now uh, about 100 sermons that we have done over the last year and a half or so in this uh, tremendous uh, epistle of Paul to the Romans and what a privilege it is uh, to consider uh, God's word together in this way. Uh, So we read together uh, verses 4 and 5 and the title for the message uh, tonight will be members in one body. For as we have many members in one body and all members have not the same office or function so we being many are one body in Christ and every one members one of another and so reads uh, God's word uh, to us what is the church is a question that's important maybe to ask at this moment Uh, what is the church how would we define what the church is. It's important that we have a proper uh, definition for the church. Uh, The Roman Catholic Church presents uh, the church more like an empire uh, with the Pope as its emperor. The Jehovah's Witnesses would refer to their so-called church as an organization. Uh, Many charismatics would describe the church as an experience Or some even treat the church like a social club. So what is the church? How would you define what the church is? In our text this evening, the apostle declares the church to be the body of Christ. That's how he defines what the church is. The nature of the church is a body. And he goes on to say that each member is a functioning part of that body as we've read for as we have many members in one body and all members have not the same office so we being many are one body in Christ and every one members one of another Uh, this morning uh, the lesson was effectively do not think too high of yourself this evening the lesson is do not think too low of yourself Uh, yes we are nothing in ourselves verse 3 but we are everything in Christ we are part of his body and therefore we are to think as we said this morning with balance on these things now the motif of the body or the the image or the idea of the body is common in the Pauline letters as well as our text we see it in 1 Corinthians 6 uh, 1 Corinthians 10 all the chapters chapter 12 in Ephesians we see it all the way from chapter 1 through chapter 5 in Colossians from chapters 1 through 3 but really the dominant chapter and if, if you want to spend more time looking at this uh, the dominant chapter that deals with the subject of the body uh, principle is 1 Corinthians 12. In fact, if you do a a word count, an analysis of the most common words found in 1 Corinthians 12, outside of the, obviously, the the small article words, uh, the most common word is body, then the word all, body 18 times, all 16 times, one 15 times, members, spirit, and another uh, 10 and 9 times, respectively. So that's really the chapter that deals with the idea of the body in a very uh, full way. Uh, But we are looking at our text this evening uh, in these two verses, Romans 12, uh, 4 and 5. Uh, John Lith's outline is is quite helpful. He's five points of the church compared to the body. His first point, it's compared to a body in its unity. Uh, secondly in the plurality of its members thirdly in the diversity of their functions fourthly in the mutual relation and dependence of each one and then fifthly in the possession of one spirit Uh, but we we will be using a different outline and that's 
um, from William Hendrickson. I don't often use other uh, people's outlines, but William Hendrickson's outline, which is a three-part outline, I find very helpful for these two verses. His three-part outline is this. First of all, the organic unity of the body. The organic unity of the body. Second of all, the purposeful diversity of the members and their functions. And then thirdly, the mutual needs and benefits of these several members who are united to Christ. So let us begin our consideration of these two verses. First of all, the organic unity of the body. Verse 4, for as we have many members in one body. Notice, first of all, we have here the unity of the body stated. Therefore, it is a fact. We don't have to create the unity of the body. This was achieved by the work of the Lord. And we see this back in John's Gospel, chapter 10 and verse 16, where we read, Other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. But we see it more clearly in John 17, verses 19 to 21. And for their sakes, and the Lord Jesus Christ praying here as he is going to the cross, and he says, for their sakes, I sanctify myself that they also might be sanctified through the truth. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. Now here's the key verse, verse 21. That they all may be one as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. So this prayer of the Lord Jesus Christ was achieved in his life and in his death. He made us one by suffering in his body for us to bring us into one body, into the body of Christ. Secondly, the unity of the body, therefore, is not something, as we've already said, that we have to create. And just to illustrate this, turn with me to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4 and verses 1 to 6. The apostle says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that ye walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Now, notice here the exhortation in verse 3. We are to endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit. But notice in the next verse, we're not told to keep the unity of the body. What he says in verse 4 is, there is one body and one spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling. In other words, there's one thing we are to keep, but another thing that we cannot create or make or we cannot break. In other words, as believers, when we become members of the body of Christ, that's it. We are members of the body of Christ, not because of what we have done, and we cannot change that. In fact, even in another place when the, the apostle is exhorting against uh, sexual sin, he says, do not join the, the members of Christ with a harlot. This unity that we have with Christ is so strong that even when we sin, serious sin, we don't cease to be members of the body of Christ, but we actually unite the body of Christ with sinful things. So therefore, this unity of the body is a fact. A fact established and created by the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not something that we create when we get together. No, we are part of of the body of Christ by the work of salvation. It says in verse 5, 
one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. It is by the indwelling presence, and this is amazing, by the indwelling presence of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, that we have become one body. We are the body of Christ. But then thirdly, because we have not created this unity, as we said, we cannot break it. Therefore, the consequence of this is unbreakable unity. 1 Corinthians 12, verses 26 and 27. And whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it. Or one member be honoured, all the members rejoice with it. Now ye are the body of Christ and members in particular. The consequence of this unbreakable unity is clear in what Paul is saying. When one of us suffer, we can't cut off like some sort of spiritual amputation. Uh, well, that's him or that's her suffering. So therefore, we'll just get rid of that member. No, we all continue to suffer with that member. Why? Because we are part of the same body of Christ. And maybe there's a very strong application here. That if I don't feel the sufferings of another believer... Maybe it brings into question my participation practically in the body of Christ. There's a, uh, there's a, a reality, reality here that Paul states that if, if one member suffers, then all the members suffer. Or if all the members be honoured, all the members rejoice with it. This is a good test of our salvation. And, and even to look at the other side. Do you rejoice when you see believers honoured? Or do we become envious? Do we become, as we saw in a, in, a, in a previous sermon, that rather than rejoice, we envy them? No, as members of the body of Christ, we are delighted when other members of the body of Christ receive honour and blessing because we are all part of the one body. But then notice as a, as, a, as a very simple observation in our text, the, the sheer immensity of the body of Christ. There's many members. And in fact, in Revelation 7 verse 9, it describes the body of Christ as a great multitude which no man can number. And I've often wondered about that. What does it mean which no man could number? And I think when we were, when we were looking at that in, in, in Revelation 7 and verse 9, I think the point I made was that no man could live long enough to count the number of the, the people of God that will stand on that day before the throne in worship. No man could number such a number. It is beyond a human life to count the number that will be gathered before the throne of God in that day. And it, it's almost an understatement in the following verse. And they cried with a loud voice saying, Salvation to our God which sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb. Then our second main heading is the purposeful diversity of the members and their functions. The purposeful diversity of the members and of their functions. One of the things that we know about our God is that our God makes things interesting. I remember this point being made to me uh, many years ago. Even if you look at creation, everything is different. There is a wonderful diversity in the creation of God. And that is true even in the church. God has made us all different. So that we might merge together in one body. He certainly has not made us all arms or legs or all heads or, or feet or so on. Why? Because that would be ridiculous. It would be ridiculous. What, what God has done is he's made us all different so that we might be one. So therefore there is this purposeful diversity of the members 
and of their functions. Do you remember what we said this morning that sometimes we might feel, uh, I wish all the other members uh, were a bit more like me. Well, that's the last thing we want. We want difference. We want diversity. We want the body of Christ to be made up of different parts, just like our own body is made up of different parts. In fact, when we look at, at a body that might have an extra finger or an extra toe, we say there's a, a problem there. No, there in, in, in the normal uh, um, uh, amalgamation of a body or putting together of a body, there are certain parts in certain places. That's exactly what God has done in, a, in his church. There is a purposeful diversity of the members of the body of Christ and their functions. Paul describes this wonderfully in 1 Corinthians 12. Uh, 1 Corinthians 12 and beginning at verse 14. 1 Corinthians 12 verse 14. For the body is not one member but many. If the foot shall say, because I am not the hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And there's a very good application here. Stop here for a moment, because I really want to press this home, because I think some of you need to hear this. Too often we look at other people and measure ourselves off others to see whether we are in the body of Christ. Notice what it says. If the foot shall say, because I am not the hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? In other words, are, are we, is our participation in the body of Christ defined by whether or not we're like somebody else? No, our relationship to the body is defined by our relationship to Christ, not by our relationship to one another primarily. And if the ear shall say, because I am not the eye, am I not of the body? Is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where the smelling? But now hath God set the members, every one of them, in the body, as it hath pleased them. What a wonderful statement. That God has placed each member of the body, each one of them, as it had pleased him. I remember many years ago when I first saw that scripture where it says that God names even all the stars. And we sing it, don't we? He's named every one of them. God has a name for every star in the heavens. Billions upon billions upon billions. But it's the same in the body of Christ. Every single part, every single member of the body of Christ has been placed just where God would have you. And that's where faith really must take over. Because when we become dissatisfied with where we are, the problem, brethren, is this, that we are calling God into question. This says that God has done what had pleased him. God has you exactly where he wants you. So therefore, we don't have to run around wondering what we should do. We just need to be faithful where we are. I love the way John MacArthur finished off one of his sermons on the will of God. And he, after, he, after he describes, uh, and we've looked at that ourselves as well, um, that the will of God is for our sanctification, for to be thankful people and so on, and all these things uh, that we, we saw in, in our message. But the way John MacArthur finishes off is really helpful. He says, having said all this, now what do we do? And he says, do as you please. And the point he makes is this. If God has put in your heart God's glory, God's desires, God's will, God's work, God's ways. If God has put all those things in your heart and mind. Then your response is to do as you please. Because what you please is the very thing that will please God. 
If you love Christ, do as you will. If you don't love him, then don't do as you will. But if you really love Christ, and one of the scriptures is, uh, Delight thyself in the Lord, and he shall grant you the desires of your heart. In other words, if I delight in God, the desires of my heart will be in accord with the will of God. Do you see the practicality of all that? So God has placed us where we are so that we might bring completion and function and blessing to the body of Christ. And this is all to do with his will. And again, that's how it fits in even 1 Corinthians 12 with our present passage Because the will of God and the functioning of the body of Christ all fits in together here. Verse 19 of 1 Corinthians 12 reads, And if they were all one member, where were the body? It's an an obvious statement that if if every part was a foot or a hand, there would be no body. Just a collection of feet or a collection of hands. But now are they many members, yet but one body. This wonderful divergence and difference. We, we often say this, don't we? I mean, if, if we weren't Christians, if we weren't believers, we, we probably uh, wouldn't spend five minutes some of us together. Uh, God has made us so different, we probably have no, nothing um, that would bring us together on any other level. But it's being part of the body of Christ. It's being disciples of Christ that gives us that wonderful unity. That gives us that wonderful togetherness that is more than just what we described at the beginning. More than just a social club or an organization or anything like that. It is something much more fundamental and much more real. Being part of the body of Christ. It goes on in verse 21. And the eye cannot say unto the hand, I have no need of thee. Nor again the head to the feet. I have no need of you. But but brethren, sometimes, maybe, we can sinfully feel that. You know, we can get tired sometimes of one another. And we can feel, well, maybe I can live without that person. Maybe I would be better without that brother or sister. What are we saying? We can tear the body of Christ apart and live without one another. You see, have we reduced the church to what these other groups that we mentioned at the beginning have reduced it to? The body of Christ is a living body. A living organism that if we bring separation, we destroy It's not an organization that we can leave one join another. Verse 22, nay, much more those members of the body which seem to be more feeble are necessary. Not a wonderful thing. It doesn't matter how weak you feel in yourself. If God has placed you in the body of Christ, it doesn't matter how feeble you are. You are necessary. Why? Because... You're something great? No, because God has placed you in the body of Christ. We were with uh, Charlotte in the A&E there a while ago and she had um, further problems with her appendix, we think, or we're not 100% sure. But in the old days, just sort of whip the appendix out, any sort of sign of a problem, it was gone. Now they're much slower to do that because they realize, rightfully so, that if it's in the body, (laughs) there must be some reason for it to be there. So evolutionists are not getting all their ways. You know, everything that's in our body has a purpose. And every member of the body of Christ has a purpose. So if we... Uh, disassociate ourselves or as Diotrephes did in as a second or third John um, exclude other people we, we can't deal in these ways with the body of Christ we are an essential part of what God is doing by bringing his and let's put it this way by bringing his son together 
And we're not to tear Christ apart. We are to be that body that God designs us to be. Verse 23. And those members of the body which we think to be less honourable, upon these we bestow more abundant honour, and our uncomely parts have more abundant comeliness. For our comely parts have no need, but God had tempered the body together, having given more abundant honour to that part which lacked. This absolute equilibrium, we could say. Why? Why? Verse 25, that there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care one for another. And whether one member suffers, all the members suffers with it, or one member be honoured, all the members rejoice with it. One commentator tells this story. There arose a fierce contention in the human body. Every member sought another place than the one it found itself in and was fitted for. After much controversy, it was agreed to refer the whole matter to one whose name was Solomon Wise in his own conceit. He was to arrange and adjust the whole business and to place every bone in its proper position. He received the appointment gladly and was filled with joy and confidence. He commenced with finding a place for himself. His proper post was the head. Oh, sorry, his, his proper post was the heel. But where do you think he found it? He must needs be the golden bowl in which the brains are deposited. The natural consequences followed. The coarse heel bone was not of the right quality, nor of the suitable dimensions to contain the brains, nor could the vessel intended for that purpose form a useful or comely part of the foot. Disorder ensued in foot, head, face, legs and arms. By the time Solomon Wise in his own conceit had reconstructed the body, it could neither walk, nor speak, nor hear, nor smell, nor see. The body was moreover filled with intolerable agony and could find no rest, every bone crying for restoration to its own place. That is to say, every one but the heel bone that was mightily pleased to be in the head and to have custody of the brains. Now, brethren, are we going to sacrifice the body so that we might get where we want to be. Is that what it's all about? Or are we going to humbly function in the place that God has put us in? The part of the body that God has given us by his own will. First of all, because it's for his glory, but then for our own good. We become more like those surgeons who like to play games with the body and change things. You saw the the example um, over the years of people like Michael Jackson who constantly messed around with his face and ends up looking and has to hide his face. Is that what we're going to do to the body of Christ? Are we going to experiment with the body of Christ? Or are we going to humbly submit ourselves to where God has placed us? Now maybe some of you are thinking, well, I don't really know exactly where God has placed me. Well then seek Him. Seek that He might reveal that to you. That He might make that clear. But don't begin And don't approach this by seeking to figure it out yourself in your own wisdom or your own conceits. Seek the Lord for this. Because this is the most fundamental thing that you can know. Your place in the body of Christ. And if you 
know your right place in his body, you will be so blessed. But if you seek to find another place that God hasn't put you in, well, only misery will ensue. Finally, our third heading. The mutual needs and benefits of these several members who are united to Christ. Verse 5 of Romans 12. So we, being many, are one body in Christ and every one members one of another. Now, if we had read on in 1 Corinthians 12, we would have read this. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Are all workers of miracles? Have all the gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? And so on. The point is clear. There are gifts and varying gifts for different parts of the body of Christ. And if I think I have a gift, if I think that this is what I'm to do, and I just give myself to this, and don't listen to the rest of the body, there's a good test. Again, (laughs) here's the test, isn't it? If I think I have a gift in a certain area, what does the rest of the body think? (laughs) How does the rest of the body feel when I exercise my gift? I've seen believers over the years who are really good as encouragers. They have the gift of encouragement. But they just don't seem happy to remain in in that place. Just to go on encouraging. That's clearly their gift. And yet the encourager gets discouraged. (laughs) Which is strange, isn't it? We have to be careful that what we believe our gift is is recognized by the rest of the body that's the test and that's why in even in the apostle Paul in his life he is sent by the church in Acts chapter 13 even the apostle Paul needs the sending of the body needs the sending of the church even in the world We see this. Could you imagine if everybody tomorrow decided they wanted to be a policeman? Or if everyone decided they wanted to be a dustbin collector? I mean, we need both. We need the dustbin collection just as much on one level as we need the police. So we all have different roles. But, But again... I love what one has said on this point. And this is often missed. That when it comes to giftedness. I think we said this only last week or the week before. When it comes to giftedness. The single most important gift. That you can give to the church is what? Yourself. It's not your abilities. It's not your um, eloquence. It's it's not your uh, suave, sophisticated way of putting the, the faith across. The greatest gift, and this is a gift that God has given, is you. So it is that being together. It is that ministering one to another. One of the difficulties, and this was pointed out in that recent debate, with a wrong view of this is that many people think that the gifts that they have are for themselves so people say in the modern church well you know God speaks to me of a word from the Lord nowhere in the New Testament does it say that any gift is for the person it is always for the benefit of what? the body It's for the benefit of the body of Christ. So whatever gift God has given you, exercise it not primarily for yourself. Live for the benefit of the body. And again, bring it back to the illustration. Every member that we have exercises itself for the benefit of the rest of the body. 
And once that happens, all is well. What is cancer? Cancer is where things start to go wrong. And what does cancer do? It attacks the body. So we have a choice, don't we? We're, on, we're either going to be a healthy part or if we don't and stop being that healthy part, we can become the cancer that can destroy all of us, all of us are, in fact, quite often in churches, it's the men in the pulpits that are, are quite often some of the worst culprits. But all of us are called to exercise our different roles and responsibilities in the body of Christ. If we do not take our own individual responsibility seriously, there is no answer. There is no solution to that. If I don't exercise my part and role in the body of Christ, there is no secondary plan. <laughs> There's no plan B. So if, if I stop exercising my role, it's not a case of, well, such and such, just take the place. Not at all. We are all called to be part and if that part goes AWOL goes missing there is no replacement because there is not multiple bodies of Christ there is only one yes and we know that there is a dual application as we close the body of Christ is universal and it's local let's just keep it local for a moment God has placed you in this body and if you are not functioning your part, well, there is no replacement. Because God's placed you here. God's placed you in the local body of Christ in this place. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. May God enable us to know the reality of these things. That we might live for the glory of God. And for the blessing of one another and for the good of our own soul. Let's stand for closing prayer. O oh Lord, we thank Thee for the wonderful truth of the body of Christ. We thank Thee, Lord, that You have called us as to be members of that body. And Lord, we pray that we would take with all seriousness, with all gravity, the responsibility that rests on each one of us to be that functioning, operating member of the body of Christ. Lord, forgive us for being selfish. Forgive us, Lord, for putting the needs of self quite often first. And Lord, grant us a love for the brethren and a love for the body of Christ that would enable us to live for his glory and for the good and for the blessing of his people. <coughs> we give thee thanks for those things that we shall receive. And the grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and the love of God our Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Amen.